and to the the last speaker is the guy who stands between me and dinner. Hmm. That's not the same as the people of the time. And I think there's just such, but there's, there's just sufficient time to in this to push off everybody. Thank you for that. The kind of subject we're trying to deal with is very huge. I'm going to deal with it in fragments necessarily. Even if you're just looking at, even if you're just looking at rural India and the kind of issues that I'm talking about or working on, then you're talking about the most complex part, what I consider to be the most complex part of the planet. 833 million people, 400, 400 living languages, six of those spoken by more than 50 million people, three of them spoken by more than 80 million, one of them spoken by 600 million, and hundreds of others spoken by between 10,000 and 1,000. Or if you take the language Saimur in Tripura, now has four speakers left. The Bondas, of course, of Koraput have just 2,000 speakers of their language. Um, and also, unrivaled occupational diversity, jobs that people have never heard of, work, work description that people cannot imagine, many of which, good and bad, are breaking down very dramatically. And then, covering that in such a brief period is a very risky and hazardous thing, but maybe I better, since I had asked them to run this, I better tell you what these are about. These are pictures of the families, the survivors, some of the families, of the farm suicide victims. Between 1995 and 2011, according to the National Crime Records Bureau, which is the only source for suicide in India, the number of farmers who committed suicide between 1995 and 2011 is in excess of a quarter of a million. That is, more than 270,000 farmers have committed suicide according to the National Crime Records Bureau. This is great underestimate which we can get into in the discussion. Eight groups, particularly women farmers, are excluded because women don't count as farmers. Uh, women don't count as farmers in the non-official but actual practice reckoning that takes place on the ground. They're farmers' wives. Though 67% of farm work is done by women. Um, we'll come back but you have to know who these are. These are families from five or six regions, from Varanar in Kerala, the one that went past just now, from Vidarbha and Marathwara in Maharashtra, from Telangana, Koshila, Andhra, and Rayala Sima in Andhra Pradesh, and a couple from Kapitra. We'll, we'll get to the farm suicide in a bit. You know, I just want to begin by telling you that March 8th is coming up. A historic date because International Women's Day is coming to that passage. It's the day on which Forbes publishes its billionaire's list. The most awaited piece in Indian journalism, as you know. Okay? The uh, Forbes billionaire, by the way, you know, it's interesting. There are very few women on the list, but for some year, they, for some reason, each year they publish it on International Women's Day. By the time it comes out, it's already ninth in India. And too bad, girls, I mean, it is the big boys there. Now, it's very, this is particularly interesting in a budget where Mr. P. Chidambaran has declared what one angry anchor on television said with furrowed brows was to send a firm signal to the super rich in India. That's what I heard the anchor say. And you can imagine somehow that Chidambaran had raised the tax rate on the super rich by 10%. He didn't realize that it was a spare charge on the tax rate with a thing. He thought it was a, in fact, you know, if it was 30%, it's going to be 40%. That's what he imagined. Now, the interesting thing is that according to Mr. Chidambaran's statistics, there are only 62,000 parole cities in India. It's a show of modesty that's totally unbecoming. Now, here, when, when you get the Forbes list, which is not about crore petitions and routine, but dollar billionaires, you will look at my asset list. 
1991, there was not a single Indian dollar billion. Okay, it was officially declared as measured by some independent person. In 2004, there were eight. In 2012, there were 48. Okay, the 48. This now, by the way, there are a few pretenders above us, but we have. More dollars. We have two and a half times the number of dollar billionaires that all the Nordic and Scandinavian countries put together have. They have 19. They have 28. Okay. We have far more than Japan and UK. Forget it. We're not in the race. Okay. The, even a couple of your billionaires are really our billionaires. Okay. So, now, the thing is, these these 28 billionaires, who is the biggest in the number? We are number four or five each year. The German speak, you know, that Deutschland, the Berlin, is there, and they are still getting about themselves. A couple of times in the last six years, they have overtaken us and made us rank number five. But usually, there are around four. Between us and the real competitor are two podiums. One is China. There are more billionaires than us, but the net asset worth of each billionaire is usually 1.1 billion. Ours is around three and three and a half billion. It used to be it used to be four point seven billion until the Church and Wall Street blew it for everybody. In two thousand and eight the figure was that in March. And so, now in uh, so the Chinese where billionaires are greater in number, but they're not asset worth is very below us. And then of course there are other the Chinese who have a lot too. You know, I'm very disappointed. You know, uh after them done when it comes to the Russians, there is our obvious moral superiority. Every five years, the Russians send all their billionaires to prison. We send ours to parliament. Now, also consider that you've declared a $1.85 trillion GDP. Your Forty-eight billionaires. It used to be fifty-five in, in two thousand and eight before the crash. Your forty-eight billionaires, their wealth is equivalent, equivalent to one eighth of your gross domestic product. That's their asset worth, net asset worth combined. That is a phenomenal figure. I, I haven't worked it out for the years, but I don't know. Even if their four hundred billionaires come up to that share of the GDP of the United States, I don't know. It doesn't matter. So we have this. On the one hand, we rank fifth in the world, if you count Germany, fifth yeah, um, in the world in dollar billionaires. And as I believe we've already been told this afternoon, the same country that ranks fifth in dollar billionaires ranks 134th in human development. And even that 134th in human development is interesting in two ways. One, if you apply the inequality index, the factor in inequality, Your HDI of 0.548 or whatever it is loses 30 percent in value. From being 134 out of 187 nations, you become 139 out of 146. That is why, if you apply the gender inequality index to that figure, what is also interesting is that about 100 countries above you, developing countries or not so rich countries, none of them had 9 percent growth during the period that our billionaires came up. None of them had the fourth largest armed forces in the world or became the world's sixth nuclear power. None of this, but they seem to have done better at handling their hunger. If you look, say, for instance, at the global hunger index, so this is true. International Food Policy Research Institute this is brings out a global hunger index. Out of the 81 hungriest nations in the world, India ranks 67. The 62 is Rwanda, which apparently handles food security better than we do. And I don't think they have any billionaires in Rwanda. Maybe one in Switzerland somewhere, but not you know, not otherwise. So you have this incredible division of forty-eight guys who write a comment to something to nominate forty-eight out of a population of one point two billion. That's the kind of concentration we're talking about. That's the kind of wealth we're talking about. The other list, by the way, I love these lists. I mean, this is my first bookmark. Type and my on my PC wherever I go, I'm always hopeful. In one day, anyway. So, 
you can, whether you look at the global hunger index, whether you're looking at the Forbes index, whether you look at the fact that in the period, oh, let me let me clear any ambivalence on one thing. I am one of those who believe that every claim of India's finance is true. It works. It just is true of a very, very small segment of your population. That's what it is. And it may be not for that, for another bigger segment of the population. But the truth of India signing is that it, it exists, it applies to a very small group of people. Now, in this period that we were talking about the growth of our billionaires and everything else, in four years between 2007 and 2011, the government of India constituted three commissions, three commissions to look at rural poverty numbers. For my friends, I was on one of those commissions. It was called the NC Sustainer Commission on the BPA Expert Group. So it was an expert group. We spent one session of discussion for several hours on whether are women really poor? You know, I mean, who said so? Right. So we had a heated discussion on whether women households should automatically be picked up this year, because some people on the commission were not sure that you know, that's the evidence of this. Which led us to look at the earlier BPL census, which was even funnier, because the rate is given, the, you know, the markings that they did said. But you know what all kind of indicators you had on that? Once, on the earlier one, we had an improvement on that. One sari household, one to two sari household, two to three sari household. Okay. So then we took this, this. What happens if there are six girls in that household? They're okay. We don't have this basis. We don't have this, thank God. The only other contribution to the coincidence is a passionate discussion about whether women were really poor. Six years among 17 men around the table without a woman in charge. But you'll be glad to know that we are a very different kind of Indian male. We finally concluded not that women were poorer, but they're not doing as well as we are. So, so you know, the sober households still get marked as automatic. In, uh, women headed households. Then 19% of rural households are women headed households, but actually a much larger proportion, especially in regions that see high male migration like Anantapur, like Wayanad. The percentage of rural households that are female headed are incredibly higher in these areas, and I suspect across the country they are still together. The reluctance of the enumerator to put that down is a woman headed household asking by the country. So the government of India, first of the three commissions was headed by Dr. Arjun Sengupta. He was thought to be very responsible and he had all the credentials, you know, World Bank, IMF, everything, so they put him in charge and he didn't give them the report they wanted. You see, you have to understand this. There are, why does a government have three reports on rural poverty in four years? Why does a government of Maharashtra have 13, one, three inquiries? and commissions on farmers to said in a period of nine years, I think it's very Indian. You keep calling on commissions until one of them gives you the report you want to hear. So the Arjun Sen Gupta report said on its first page, you can, you can bring it up on the net right now if you like, on its first page that 836 million Indians live on less than 20 rupees, a, and live on 20 rupees a day or less total expenditure. Included in that figure, not on the first page, but on page 7, is 85% of all Muslims fall into that category. 88% of all Adivasis and Dalits fall into that category of those 836 million. It, is, it isn't such a different figure from what has been proposed quite recently by Montek last year in his affidavit before the Supreme Court, which works out to 23 rupees 85 pounds per day if you break down the monthly figure for rural areas and 20. 8 rupees 45 paisa a day for uh, urban, you know, total expenditure in an urban area. If you spend 23 or 24 or 20, 24 or 29 rupees, you're not poor. But leave that aside. I think some good guys report with you down there and others on this report. They have a very dismal report, and the Prime Minister, on accepting it on August 7, 2007, made his displeasure very clear. At that moment, a second commission, we were all sent out our notices to 
report for the second commission within a week of that report being submitted. So we need a second. We we split the purpose, okay? We drop it down from 27 percent to 55 percent. My only contribution is to first an NXI one, which is the biggest connector, and it is my different note. Otherwise, I made my previous contribution to the. I did plug a bit to you guys, and then it came to the discussion on very. Then for the entry section of commission, when passed, the government was still not happy. So it brought out a third commission, the Kasturaj Tendulkar Commission, who brought it down to 42 percent. Now, this was, you know, this was the biggest step. That's the Tendulkar. You see, one Tendulkar raises the average, the other two put that. The, the, but as Dr. Suresh Tendulkar did his job, and it turned rural poverty came down to 42 percent. But you love it, from 77 to 42 percent in a matter of 36 months. Right. And then, because of an outcry about that, a fourth subgroup was formed to to grasp on various things, Tendulkar is 10 percent or minus 5 percent. Okay. My favorite poverty study though was done by the NCAA. You know the National Council for Applied Economic Research that generated three times. I was present when they launched their first report on it in 1996 in Bhopal. Uh, I'd love to share this with you because it's a very powerful experience when two of the great minds of the NCAA are put forward forward in Bhopal. In those days, human development reports had become the buzzword. Okay? Everybody was, I mean, that day, in Madhya Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh became the first place to bring out its own state human development report. Madhya Pradesh was the first state in the country to bring out, I, I was one of the board of editors. Anyway, the NCAAR had converted some purchasing power study into a priority study. And the chairman of the director of NCAAR told the crowd, which included some 40 odd journalists in the top auditorium, at the seminar that uh, we, we did the biggest study ever on poverty in India, covering 33,000 households to which the chief economist shifts and change across more than 300 parameters. Hello, 300 parameters. Yes, sir. Thank you. Up to that point, the journalists in the audience, the journalists in the seminar, were doing what all journalists do in all seminars. They were sleeping in a peaceful, non confrontational manner. But when somebody said, you know, it sort of dropped us back into the real world, the guy next to me, who is a veteran of Bhopal journalism from my area, dug his. I go into my room. I said, excuse me, but did you say, did you say that they did interviews with more than 300 questions? With 300 questions, I said, no, he said, more than 300. <laughs> then this guy put his hand on his head. That means journalist. He said, 35 years I make a living from doing interviews. The biggest interview I ever did had nine questions. That was with my boss's best friend. And the last question was, may I go now? What the hell did they do 300? So I put up my hand on behalf of the outraged fraternity and addressed, I put up my hand on behalf of the outraged journalistic fraternity and addressed Dr. Rakesh Mohan. So she was wondering who it was. And I said, you know, Dr. Mohan, if, if you ask, no wonder the poverty figures are declining. If you count out these agricultural workers, in less than 300, 300 plus questions, your respondents are more likely to die of fatigue than of poverty. How the hell did you get the question out about in a frame or a truck? Okay, because you did 33,000 questions, but 300 plus questions. Anyway, he was not pleased. Uh, I don't know that, but anyway, he said, he said, Excuse me, this was a very scientific study done with two investigators per household. That makes sense to us because one investigator to hold the interview is done physically and put it down the other day. One of the other ones can tell the question.
the last few years, the fastest growing thing in India is not IT or IT or anything like that. The fastest growing thing in India, the fastest growing sector in India is internet. It has grown faster than at any point in the preceding 45 years of Indian economy. It is growing rapidly and dramatically, and there are any number of parameters. We don't have the time to. I mean, I could just take out of this session, talk to you, or give you the indicators. Like I only gave you the Forbes list and the Global Hunger Index list. There's one list on which nobody can do this. Okay? The Forbes list of fastest growing. We have to get one to four on that. But anyway, the number one reason for your for your nationalistic pride. Mr. Mr. Lakshmi Mittal. He this problem. It was wedding season in India, so he couldn't get a proper hall. So he was just compelled to rent the Versailles Palace, the Palace of Versailles. You know, and they had a film crew to Mittal the movie, which will come soon. So they, they had a film crew from Bollywood to film the costliest wedding in the world. I don't remember whether it was 60 million pounds or it doesn't matter if it was Google. I mean, it doesn't. It's just a thing in English. We also have the privilege of the town I come from, where I'm in my residence in Mumbai, the world's costliest and ugliest personal residence. Okay? Look, I'm coming to your meeting out of Marathwara, where the biggest drought in half a century is going on. And all around Western Maharashtra and Marathwara, Buildings are coming up in large numbers with swimming pools on every floor, on every floor, in an area where there is a small bad district, which today, in all its states in the world, has 97 million liters of water left. That is 3.45 TMC, 1000 million cubic feet. So, TMC. Million, 3.45 million metric cubic feet. The whole district, in all its 245 water projects, one major, 17 medium, 194 or something minor, has 97 million meters of water left. But in the region, and in Western Maharashtra, which claims to be even worse affected, all over Pune, you drive from Mumbai to Pune, you see the holding of these buildings coming up with separate swimming pools on each floor. There's something gross and it seems beyond acceptability. So we can go on on those kinds of numbers forever, but I want to try and give you a quick picture of some of these. Um, I mean, you can also look at the contrast in terms of uh, this was the magazine, the business in there, not sure. But I pointed out two years ago that a new restaurant opens in one of the metros every day. You see metro in India every day there's a new restaurant. Which is interesting considering that the you know in the same country, the percentage of malnourishment among children under the age of five, according to your planning commission's India Human Development Report, put out by the IAMR division, is almost double that of sub Saharan Africa. Yours is forty six forty six percent. Sub-Saharan African average is 25 percent. But a new restaurant opens, and many British restaurants, that also the magazine was very thrilled about, open. Um, so, as we move on from that, we want the numbers, we give you those numbers, but let's look at some of the things that are happening which are very important in the census side, and I think to be a general census. Census 2011 is unique among censuses in India. There are things that it shows that have not occurred in any census previous. One, and what is, what is the thing, what is the one that touches my mind? For the first time in independent India's history, for the first time since 1921, urban India has added more people to its total than rural India. 91 million to 90 million. Now why is this such a big deal? It's a big deal because that has never been the case since 1921. If you take the 2001 census, urban India added 68 million people, rural India added 113 million people. From a 
of 113 to 68 million in some years to make it 91 to 90 million. It's a huge thing. It is a huge thing. How do you explain it? The census gives three reasons. Actually, in my opinion, only one of those reasons is only one. One is family size, natural, I mean, migration, re reclassification of villages as time. Let's look at all these. If you look at reclassification of villages as time, that happened in every center. The villages being reclassified as time has happened in every center. Why in this census was the change so dramatic? So I looked at the number of reclassifications, I mean, at the number of villages, uh, new towns. There are two kinds of towns reported in India all day. If you're not familiar with them, go up and look at this, look at the census on this, on your website, they'll give you the definition. There is, there are statutory towns, which are your evolved towns, with all the paraphernalia of a town, okay, with, with your municipality, your fire brigade, your police station, everything else, that's a proper evolved town. And then there is the census town, which is an arbitrary town. What is, what is the criteria for a census town? When the population of a village crosses 5,000, B, when the density of the population crosses 400 per square kilometer, and C, most important, when male workers in the agricultural workforce fall to less than 25% of the workforce, which means that agriculture has collapsed in that area. So that these are the three criteria for declaring a census town. Now, if you look at the 2001 census, it shows a huge rise in statutory towns, and census towns actually were staggering. If you look at the 2011 census, statutory towns haven't moved, census towns have almost moved. I and mean, it was just shot up. What does it all do? Collapse in agrarian sector, mass migration. These are the migration is included in the census as one of the reasons, but they don't elaborate on what they mean by that. If you want to look at some of these figures, let's say for agriculture, today and, and migration as well and work as well, agriculture now supports 53% of the population and produces and creates 14.1% of the GDP. Now they keep saying the sector cannot support so many people. So, but I'll come back to migration in a moment. First, I'll come back to migration soon. Over the last eight years, I'm a rural journalist. I spent two seventy to 300 days a year in particular regions of villages of the country. That's my, you know, footloose and time history. I'm allowed to do that by my paper. I choose where I go. And I anchor myself at a particular place according to the issues that I think are important. The migrations have been coming and stupendous. Out of these 300 to 70, 300 days, I spent 40 to 60 days as a migrant. I lived with migrants, I traveled with migrants, I watched what they, what they do. I even tried replicating them in some ways, but mostly I recorded on, on camera and in writing. In 1993, I had made a trip from one of the highest migration districts in the south of India, it's called Mahbub Nagar. Considered to be the poorest district of present day Andhra Pradesh. Mahbub Nagar is considered to be the poorest district of Andhra Pradesh, about 90 minutes drive from Hyderabad, from your home uh, The I took a bus from Mahbub Nagar to Mumbai. There was not a full direct bus. There was one bus a week, and we changed buses twice in order to reach Mumbai. There were 58 people on the bus, 58 to 60 people on the bus, and the allowed capacity was 58. One bus a week. 2003, I took the same service from the same bus route. There were 42 buses a week. Direct to Mumbai. The first bus had taken 36, 38 hours, we changed buses twice. The second bus, in 2003, 42 Government services were flying each week, apart from innumerable blade services, removal services, etc., because of the number of workers going towards Mumbai's construction booth, and because of a collapse of agriculture and work opportunities in the Telangana region. So there was that kind of it. Okay, that's Telangana. What about Kerala? 
we were Kerala was always a high migration state, right? Wrong. There is one district in Kerala that has never seen out migration in the past. In fact, it saw so much in migration, it was called the Gulf of Kerala or the Dubai of Kerala. And that district was Vayanad. Vayanad district of Kerala is the cash crop center of Kerala. It's a, it's a travesty of history that it's a cash crop district. The name Vayanad, any, any good money is over here? Where does the name Vayanad come from? Vayal means, Vayal means study. It means study land, and you can't find 10,000 acres of study in Vayanad today. So you can find coffee, pepper, vanilla, cardamom, tea, rubber. But Vayanad was the heart of Kerala's study. The district was named after study. Vayanad, there were no out migrants. When you look at Vayanad, in, in, in 1995, there were no bus services between the district of Vayanad, main, main bus stand, Manitavadi. From the Manitavadi bus stand to the coffee plantations of Kur, to a Kutta in Kur district of Karnataka, there was no bus service. In, 19, in, in 1995, there was no bus service. In 1997, there were two bus services. In 2004, there were 24 buses a day taking workers from Kerala willing to work at half the rate of Kerala in Karnataka because the agrarian crisis had destroyed there. There was no work and farmers, there were large numbers of farm suicides. Um, a complete collapse of agriculture is part of what we can, we can discuss and what happens to it. The thing is that we keep talking about this sector cannot support so many people. You know, Mr. Chandrababu Naidu famously brought in the McKinsey report within 2020. A little digression. A McKinsey report implemented by government, and it, it's the case of death. No government has ever survived it. Hmm? So the, the report said we must get 40% of the people of Andhra Pradesh off agriculture. The government succeeded. They got millions of people off agriculture, and without any options, without any alternatives, without anything, like we're doing now in Jharkhand, from where two lakh girls are in the national capital of Delhi, working as full-time domestic servants on call 24 hours around the clock. Two lakh girls from just a tiny state called Jharkhand. You'll find them now in Goa and Bangalore as well. They come through the search method. Okay. Because their livelihoods have been destroyed where they are. And between them, if you look at the 2001 census, the new data for 2009 has not come, which will come at the end of this month. But if you look at the 2001 census, it tells us that between 1991 and 2001, 7.5 million farmers took agriculture for good. That, my friend, is an average rate of 2,000 per day keeping agriculture. So, go to work. Where are the options? When you look at the getting term of that line, He's not about to be absorbed by interest. Okay? He's, not a, he's not about to be absorbed by interest. Forty years ago, when a peasant left Ratnagiri in the Kankan and came to Mumbai, he or she went into the mill, which are today real estate, much of it also owned by Mukesh Bai. And they had an option to do all those factories are real estate. The lady who cleans my house, and five other, six other flats in our building. She's a farmer from Taliban. One of the conditions they make, any work inside the house, no work outside the door because of their status as farmers. They feel humiliated if, they, if people see them doing the work. So it's a kind of, each, each season, she brings my wife and me five to ten kgs of brown rice from her field in Taliban. Excellent quality rice. But completely decides to get no price for that rice. Nothing. So you have seven and a half million farmers dropping out. Now, how many dropped out between 2001 and 11? We will only know in the smart area. When the data comes on schedule class, schedule five, farm population. But you see this. Whole villages have followed out. Thousands of families have actually split up as 
different sections of families go to different parts of the country looking for work, like the people who leave Kalahandi and Bolangir every single day of the calendar year. From Kalahandi and Bolangir, typically a worker goes, here is the reason why we will never capture the migration figures. Neither the census nor the National Census Service is geared to capture short term migration. You look at the definitions of migration. Circular migration, stop migration, short term migration are not covered. The Registrar General of India, Sandra Mali, has very honestly said we are not in a place. Our questionnaire does not allow us to count short term migration, it does not, it's not capable of it. Now, Typically, a worker in Kalahandi will go to Raipur in Chhattisgarh and see that it starts for two months during which the tourist season is on. Okay? Then he will come back and he will go to Vijayanagaram in Andhra Pradesh where he will make this. Then he can get three months work at a time and then again later in the year. Then he will go to Mumbai and work in the construction sector according to the project. The project gets over in 30 days. The Malik may shift him to another project, a bridge in family, a and that's why those buses started increasing. Okay. So you have the number of buses in Kalahandi, when I was covering Kalahandi for my book, Everybody Writes a Good Drive, there were three buses a day to write with, direct buses. Today there are 14 direct buses a day to write with. Okay. <coughs> there are many buses from other towns close by to Kalahandi which are going to write So what? This is the kind of distress that we are looking at. That's the kind of distress. Meanwhile, we keep, we have tripled the rural agricultural credit, we have tripled the agricultural credit budget. We do nothing in less than high, by high. We have already doubled our return. Okay? And here's the problem. The Indian genius, by the way, lies in two things. One is in numbers, the other is definition. We define a problem out of interest. If I define this table as a house, we are halfway home to solving the house problem. So, oh yeah, hold on. 34th round of NSS, 34th round of NSS counted tents as houses for cultural reasons. Okay. So, why don't you just define a sleeping bag as a house and leave the banquet? And then the army can distribute this and we can, we can get rid of that problem. But, but here is the agricultural credit from the period of the reform, dramatic changes have taken place. Between 91 and 2001, the indebtedness of the peasantry doubled. The percentage of dependence on of all sectors of the countryside on informal and money lending credit just shot up. Particularly, look at a government which never stops talking and never stops using the word inclusiveness, financial inclusion, financial inclusion. For me, when you have to keep saying that in every speech you make, it's a measure of how much exclusion you're talking about or how much exclusion you're looking at. You wouldn't have to dab like that if, if, if you were not looking at some gigantic exclusion. Now, the countryside of the people of rural India suffered a fall in access to agriculture, of course to credit, not forget agriculture. Particularly, Dalit and Adivas. Particularly, if the percentage fall for uh, if a person, let me just give you that exact figure um, in Dalit. Um, if the percentage fall for other sections was 12 percentage points, for Dalit it was 15 percentage points. Meaning the, uh, the increase in recourse to informal credit and money lender credit. The poorer, the weaker you were, the less your access to credit became whether rural credit or agricultural credit. Yes, how? How did they do this? They redefined the word agricultural credit. They redefined the word rural credit. Between 2003 and 2012, we have redefined the word indirect finance to agriculture at least six times. Do you know what it comes under indirect finance to agriculture now? Mukesh and Bani I'm not kidding you. Last year, last year, all input dealers, all dealers of vehicles which are being used in rural India, like tractors, etc., machinery, all of these, regardless of where they are located after the last, they may be located in Pandigar, they may be located in the National Capital Territory, but they get agricultural credit at preferential rates of interest. So, indirect finance has crowded out direct finance to the farmer. Do you know to what extent? Maharashtra, second biggest state in the country, 115 million population, 
115 million population. That large percentage of agricultural credit was disbursed there in Maharashtra. 51 percent. I am not talking here about rural credit. I am talking about agricultural credit. 51 percent of agricultural credit in Maharashtra was disbursed in the metro branches of Mumbai. That's the last thing. All those poor struggling homesteads in Malabar Hill. Right? All those poor suffering peasants in Kastari. The 51 percent of agricultural credit is dismissed through the government metro branches. We are talking about human suffering here. So there has been a gigantic transfer of money from poor to rich. That was agricultural credit. Just two days ago, the Reserve Bank of India has directed the Bank of Maharashtra to stop English finance loans to give money. The RBI has told the Bank of Maharashtra to stop indirect finance loans. By the way, the indirect finance loan for the Bank of Maharashtra, the biggest loan went to Vijay Malia. Not for agriculture, but we didn't give it to him for so they gave it to him so that he could think things so quickly. Okay, but, but the Bank of Maharashtra is a bank of farmers. It is the lead bank of Western Maharashtra. Twenty percent of its depositors are small marginal farmers. Another twenty percent are government employees present, serving and, and retired. The pensions are in the bank. In the middle of this drought, the farmers of Western Maharashtra are not able to get loans from the Bank of Maharashtra, but Vijay Malia. That's the incredible. Now, anyway, what we do, let me let me try telling you what was, I believe. Let me introduce you to a discipline I call Mechanomics. It's called McDonald's Economics. It tastes the same everywhere. Mechanomics has in terms of, you know, all our policy packages of the last 20 years. So it is the same everywhere. One, these are the essential features of the policy packages. I speak in English and not in the uh, English. I was going to say something I want because at that point here we get very mad. So, uh, okay. One is the withdrawal of the state from sectors that matter to poor people. I maintain that the state has not withered away in the Marxian dream. The state is more interventionist than it has ever been, and notably so on behalf of the rich and the rich. You have the state has withdrawn from sectors that matter to poor people. Second, huge expenditure tax, which are seen in an English country. Rapid transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. How many of you have looked at the latest budget? How many of you have looked at annex of wealth? Um, since 2007, the budget carries a particular section. For me, that is the first thing I look at in the budget. It's called Statement of Revenue Foregone. Statement of Revenue Foregone. Okay? And it means exactly that. It means the revenue they didn't collect which they were entitled to for whatever means. In this, I write off the hypocrisy, the sheer hypocrisy of having debates over whether we can afford universal public distribution system, the sheer hypocrisy and the obscenity of discussing whether Indian children who are the most malnourished in the world, double that of sub Saharan Africa, deserve more money as much as 90,000 crores. Do you know what is the in direct income tax write off for the corporate sector in the latest budget, the corporate income tax will leave out export duty and customs duty. Corporate income tax, 68,000 crores. And it is going to be 80,000, I'll tell you why. You look at the previous year's estimate. Previous year's estimate was 51,000. Final revised figure is 62,000. So now you've got 68,000 of the estimate. You know your bet on what it will be next year and what final revised figure is. Then, you have 2 lakh crores in customs duty write off 2 lakh crores in uh, mm. duty write off What are the items that are being written off? I'm not even taking all items of production. I'm taking the major production, the major commodity group. 
Of course, everyone knows petroleum. After petroleum dies, over a seven-year period for which the data are available, would anyone like to guess what is the biggest question due to the type of the metal? Worth 156 lakh crores in the last 36 months. What is the biggest writer? Gold, diamonds, and jewelry. Gold, diamonds, and jewelry. 52 lakh crores two years ago, 57 lakh crores last year, another 53 lakh crores. And in every case, the final revised estimate is 8 to 10 percent higher than the first estimate given in the budget. Just ask yourself this, okay? Why is a killing themselves because they're not able to get a loan from the bank of 20,000 rupees for the crop loan? Oh, let me give you another fact point about that. How do we know who's getting the money in agriculture? We do know. We do know. The RBI, there has been some stupendous work done on this by Professor R. Ramakumar of the Patent Institute of Social Sciences. Ramakumar has looked at loan size and composition. He's looked at it from 2001 to 2009. What's fascinating in this period is that loans of loans below fifty thousand. Who takes loans of below fifty thousand? Small farmers. Below fifty thousand, below twenty thousand, the whole whole body. Loans below fifty thousand collapsed by more than fifty percent. Guess what? Went up. Loans between ten and twenty-five crores. How many peasants have you met lately who take loans of ten and twenty-five crores? That has always been the case. So, if you ask that indirect finance is trading out direct finance to agriculture, it tells you who is getting the money. So, the agricultural credit bill, the upgrade, the access for small and marginal farmers to the credit has not grown. The pressures of money lenders have grown. I'll give you three of the stories of people over here, and then we'll discuss it. Over a period of 20 years, over a period of 20 years, The gigantic, oh, oh, but I have to tell you the the mantras of Nakamani. It reduces the state from sectors matter to what matter to the poor. Huge expenditure cut, rapid transfer of wealth. You know the statement of revenue foregone this time. The transfer of that that is worth five lakh ten thousand crores. Five lakh ten thousand crores. Okay. If you ask for the last seven years for which the data are available, it comes to thirty one lakh. Crore, 31 lakh crore. It's like figuring out how many trillions of, it's about half a trillion dollars, I think, if you check it at at that particular piece of particular piece of dollar. Then there is this unbridled rise of corporate power that writes your laws, writes the budget, writes everything. There is the imposition of user fees and tax on people who can least afford it. There is what I call the privatization. Of just about everything, including intellect and soul. Many years ago, in early 2000, I used to be puzzled when my friends and I were introduced at meeting here. Public intellectual, I used to wonder what that is. I have figured out since then that many of the others have been privately. You know, they belong to some corporate think tank or the other. So when those of us who haven't yet got the right price and sold, we are public intellectuals. The rise of the ideology of market fundamentalism, the growth of inequality, the subordination of local governance, like in land acquisition, and a great unraveling that has taken place. Finally, we have the culmination of these uh, pump of the crisis and the pressure in the countryside, resulting, resulting in two lakh seventy thousand plus farmers suicide. Now we have this data for 17 years, and we can put it through all kinds of exercises. Let's divide it into the first eight years, or the second nine years, or the first nine years, and the second eight years. The second eight years, the second nine years, are much worse than the first eight years. The rate of increase, the annual average increase of the farm suicide, is about 1,500 in the second period, over the compared to the first period. Two thirds of your farm suicides are occurring in five states. Two thirds of it. Now we have thirteen commissions, but let me tell you what the farmers are saying about the suicide in their suicide notes. I do not believe that in any part of the world, and you've seen the photo of the man. It will come back. Uh, in any part of the world, that 
people have addressed their suicide notes, not to their loved ones, not to their parents or children, not to their wives and near and dear ones. They have addressed their suicide notes consistently in the Dabba to the Prime Minister, the Finance Minister, the Chief Justice of India, the Speaker of the Lok Sabha and the Prime Minister. And this, in these letters we find extraordinary details of their experiences of the banking system, of credit, of rapacious money lending. Some of the suicide notes read like a page out of Dickens. Ramachandra Ratan Rao in Vasil, you see, you're a small fellow in a village, your life is a struggle for authenticity. You want to, you want to get the Tesseldar stamp on your, you want to get the Tesseldar seal on something else. So you know what Ramachandra Ratan Rao did in order to have his suicide taken seriously, addressed to the President of India, do you know what he wrote his suicide note on? 100 rupees stamp paper. And that is stamp by the paper. So don't show the person that the content. Con content. You just have the notarization there, right? He has written his suicide note on non judicial stamp paper. So that it will be taken seriously. Understand the kind of misery, the kind of depredations that are being inflicted on the poor in your country. I don't think we have more time, but maybe come up with this thing. Can you do better than this with me? Absolutely. You know, I, I was already asked outside about some optimistic note of the earth. You know, I think between fake optimism and cynical pessimism, there is a territory called hope. I inhabit that. I won't be a journalist for 32 years covering this kind of crap. If I didn't have that, and I didn't see the capacity for change in the people I covered, if I didn't see that capacity, I wouldn't give, you know, I wouldn't give my life to it, as I have for 32 years. The thing is this: the the, the legislation, the laws, the principles, all of them already exist for you. You don't have to create something spectacular in you. The broad framework exists for you. It exists in a section of your constitution that is unique amongst constitutions. Constitutions normally lay down the laws, the norms, the principles, the punishments, the penalties, the rights and the duties. The Indian constitution has one special section. It's called the Directive Principles of State Policy. It is one place where the constitution makers, where the makers of a constitution drew up a vision of what society they wanted. Okay? You read those principles. Already one of those principles has been converted into a fundamental right, the right to education, severely translated, and you might convert the food right to food also into that, again severely translated. I argue that if you convert the directive principles of state policy into a bill of rights, you are already on a basis on which you can turn to the And implementation of that bill of rights is nothing short of a revolution. Be clear about that. It is, it is a very revolutionary act to uphold your constitution. In 1948, when Baba Sahib and Dekker gave over the draft of the constitution to the constituent assembly that was to actually, you know, formalize the constitution, he, he made what I consider remains the greatest speech on inequality in India. When he gave the constitution to this would-be parliamentarian, he said, I give you this constitution in great precedence. I am apprehensive as I hand you this work that we have done for three years. I am apprehensive because, he says, I am apprehensive because we are entering a period of great paradox. The science as it was written yesterday, the man said it in 1948. We are entering a period of great paradox. We have constructed this beautiful political democracy. We have, con we have constructed equality in the political sphere, but in the social and economic sphere, there is no democracy, there is no equality. And he said, the tension, the tension between the lack of democracy in the social and economic sphere and the, and the political system will one day lead to the explosion of our political democracy. I think 60 odd years later, we are exactly at the crossroads that we mentioned. 
The American judge, Justice Louis Brandeis, put it in another way when he dismissed the case calling for abolition of income tax. He said it in one line. He said, you can either have great concentration of wealth or you can have democracy. You cannot have both. Thank you.